welcome to this uh, online seminar towards a new security paradigm of the Eastern Partnership Expectations and Reality um, of Heinrich Böll Foundation South Caucasus Office. Uh, warm welcome uh, again, an online event and uh, unfortunately not an event uh, where we meet each other. This event is, um, is part of our lecture serial on war and peace in the South Caucasus. Um, so uh, we, we are organizing as, as an office. Uh, we do this as a public event um, every year. Um, and um, we, we, um, we, uh, we focus not only on the conflicts in the South Caucasus, but we also have every year this one event where we, we are looking on other conflicts uh, and mostly on, uh, on the Ukrainian conflict on Donbas region, um, just to look also broader into the region, how conflicts um, are developing during this year. I would say this is a difficult year, uh, not only for the South Caucasus um, with pandemic and several crises, Beside uh, the events in Belarus, um, it is uh, first of all the war in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, which changed reality here in the region, in the South Caucasus. Uh, the EU was no player in, a in the negotiating a ceasefire agreement, and Russia created a new reality with now uh, peacekeepers on the ground. What we observe, I think, at the moment, I think there are some, some trends uh, in the post-Soviet region. I think we observe a reshuffling of post-Soviet conflict zones and third powers are coming increasingly in to the region and also in the conflicts. And we could see this here in Karabakh uh, with Turkey, uh, but I think also a country like Iran will, will more and more come uh, in, into, into the region. Russia is still the major security actor in the region, uh, but it will become economically weaker within the next years and, and maybe even more challenged also by, by third powers. EU's Eastern Partnership is lacking a security dimension. There is a discussion going on if the EU should not become more a player in soft security, um, uh, like cyber or disinformation. But I think what we have, what the challenges we are here are hard security challenges. And it is really about uh, uh, conflicts which are becoming more tense uh, and, and the use also of military means, I think a new um, uh, topical technique, I think is also changing these, these, these conflicts uh, and also um, uh, yeah, how, they are, how, they, how, how, how the wars are going on. Um, at, the, um, at the same time, there seems to be not enough. And even now, after there was a ceasefire agreement, there is no major EU initiative to bring a multilateral process back. The war in Donbas is going on, not so much anymore in the headlines. Um, yeah, I think we don't read so much anymore, uh, but people still dying uh, and there, there, there's no solution visible at the moment. Um, here is the EU and uh, OSCE uh, more active, um, but a really breakthrough will not come soon. Um, maybe the last point is uh, internal crises in Ukraine and Georgia. Uh, I think we can also observe at the moment in Georgia after the election, I think there is a kind of a political crisis and in Ukraine, we also have an institutional uh, crisis there. Um, but I think looking into the region, Armenia has lost part of its sovereignty now um, and approaches of civil conflict mediation and solution is even more needed, but is also under pressure. Yeah, I think those people who engaged in conflict um, uh, in, in, in peaceful conflict uh, solution, I think they are also under pressure. Um, I think we have three great speakers. I'm very happy that, uh, that we have you for this discussion uh, today here. There, um, first of all, we have Olesya Vatanyan, uh, who is senior anal analyst for the South Caucasus uh, region uh, at the International Crisis Group. Um, I think you all know her as, as really a strong specialist on the conflicts here in the South Caucasus. Um, we have Nikolaus von Twickel, uh, who is um, a editor at the Center for Liberal Modernity in Berlin. Uh, and he worked with uh, OSCE monitoring mission in Donetsk in 2015 and 16. So I think he's, he is really a, a, a very good expert also on, uh, or especially on, on Donbass and on the conflict in, um, in Don, Don, Donbass. And we have uh, Nona Michelice, head of the Eastern Europe and Eurasia program uh, at the um, Italian Institute of International Affairs. Um, uh, she knows Eastern partnership policy very well, um, neighborhood policy of the EU, and, and uh, yeah, I think also, um, uh, I think strong view on, on Georgia and, and uh, uh, on, on, on the region. 
Um, we will start uh, with uh, kickoffs, three kicks, kickoffs uh, with around 10 minutes uh, of each of you. I might have follow-up questions and then and then we will take questions also from the from the auditorium. You can ask questions through the chat also during um, these inputs and my uh, colleague Lilia will then read these questions um, and we will have uh, like two rounds, let's see, for, for, for questions and answers. So my first question goes to uh, Olesia, just as a, as a kick off, um, what, ne what next now from the conflict resolution perspective in Karabakh? Um, the OSC Minsk format seems to be gone um, and what is needed and what can the EU also provide? So what, what can external actors who wants to have a kind of a, how to say it, um, a more civil uh, peace solution, uh, what can they do? And I think a lot of questions are still open with this ceasefire agreement. So I think we are just in the next stage of this conflict, in my opinion. Yeah, Olesia, the floor is yours. I agree with you in terms of uh, that we have a ceasefire statement, but we do not really have a peace process and uh, the, the conflict is clearly not resolved yet. So we will be seeing continuation. And um, yeah, in fact, with where um, established uh, or led uh, to the establishment of the new security, uh, grand security situation in the whole region. And I would say that it's not only about the Russian peacekeeping now present inside Nagorno-Karabakh, but it's actually the Turkish role that is now, mm, uh, they are still discussing, but we understand that Turkey will clearly have a certain role and certain presence inside Azerbaijan. And it is not only about uh, Armenia uh, now losing more sovereignty, it's about Azerbaijan as well. Azerbaijan stayed the, um, the only country in the South Caucasus without uh, presence of the Russian military troops uh, on the ground uh, before it was war. Now this with, with has changed. Um, and uh, what we currently have is a statement that prescribes um, nine kind of points, uh, but there is so much uncertainty about uh, what, what is next and how the situation on the ground, what, what it would look like. And just kind of to give you an example, uh, the statement prescribes uh, the return of the remaining adjacent territories to Baku's direct control, but at the same time, we do not really understand what the Russian peacekeepers will be doing uh, in the conflict zone. We know that their number is up to up to 2,000, uh, which is really a small number. You know, if you if they are to be responsible for the protection of the local population. So does it mean that they will be just stationed and the observation points um, kind of, you know, preventing uh, a new big war, uh, but not really interfering in, into kind of daily things, you know, daily issues. And this will be a major uh, thing uh, in, in the coming weeks, months, and probably even years. Because uh, if before we had uh, a long front line, the line of contact, with uh, trenches, uh, Armenian and Azerbaijani trenches, and on the Armenian side with civilian areas were separated from the front line by kilometers or with adjacent territories. Right now with new front line, new position is right at the Armenian villages, uh, at the Armenian towns, and uh, in some cases even inside uh, the villages. Um, I spoke to some people uh, who went to see uh, their homes and many of them came back just because they, uh, they say that now their homes are located between with uh, currently temporary positions, you know, and, but uh, who knows, maybe they will turn into something more permanent. And uh, I, I don't think that uh, for the region, it's a good thing, but you know, if we are to see a new kind of uh, front line running through the civilian areas, um, this, this is going to be a major, think, you know, um, at least kind of on daily basis, maybe several times even uh, a week or a month, we will, be see, we will be hearing about some incidents taking place. Um, just because, you know, this will be, it's like a chess match right now with Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, and it's really very difficult to see how with uh, security arrangements on the ground are going to play. And for the moment, this is really very concerning to me personally. No one is really discussing uh, what with daily life, you know, with daily security will look like. Um, 
I hope that at certain moment people will start uh, thinking about this because uh, if, uh, for example, there are no proper arrangements, like one would think about like demilitarized uh, zones, for example, or some certain regular meetings between the Armenian and Azerbaijani representatives to discuss incidents, or if it's too politically sensitive, then discussing like daily issues of water supply, road uh, management, I don't know, ecology, humanitarian issues. If we are not to see something like this, then we will just have a new front line, and that front line will be more dangerous uh, with a more potential for incidents and uh, um, constant destabilization, you know, on the ground. I don't think that this is something that uh, those who were kind of, you know, writing that statement, ceasefire statement, they had in mind. Um, when it comes to the Russian peacekeeping, um, I should say that uh, it's kind of, it's definitely very different from what, for example, uh, Georgia had uh, in uh, in the 90s and before 2008 war in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Well, what, first of all, one should remember that in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, we were not pure Russian peacekeepers. They were part of uh, a certain kind of arrangements, you know, that included uh, the presence of the UN monitoring and also OSC monitoring. In this particular case, we so far have been hearing only about the Turkish monitoring, not uh, not any kind of you know UN observance, not to mention the OSC. And you uh, you spoke about the OSC means group uh, uh, and its future. No one knows what it whether this uh, format will stay in place or they uh, it will have to get replaced with something. Russia, Turkey, Iran, you know, process between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Um, I personally think that the OSC means group is something that um, that should stay and should have a certain role, or at least some portions of the OSC arrangements, like for example, the personal representative's office uh, that uh, has been around, you know, since, mm, since 1995, and which is responsible for confidence uh, building measures and, uh, uh, and also sustaining some certain communication between the sides. Um, for the moment, it's really very unclear. And I think one of the reasons for that is just because first, uh, Russia and Turkey, they are still in, in the process of shaping, you know, their mm, presence on the ground, what it would look like, you know, who is responsible for what, where each of them is stationed. And uh, they just don't want to include into this any kind of, you know, internationals who may try to, <laughs> to get their portion of pie for free. And uh, the second thing is uh, also um, with the withdrawal of the Armenian troops from the adjacent territories, it finalizes next week, you know, on, on 1st of December. So before that, um, I, I hope that after that, at certain point, we will be seeing, uh, um, you know, Russia, for example, inviting France and US uh, to have their say, or at least kind of, you know, to give, um, an approval to, to the current uh, security setup that engages Russia and Turkey. Um, that can happen either through the UN Security Council or um, which is less likely at the uh, upcoming OAC Ministerial Council. Um, so, it, and in terms of the EU, this is the first time that I'm <laughs> even mentioning it. <laughs> Uh, in this whole conversation, really, this is a really very sad um, story, what we have been seeing. Um, I, I met so many angry people, you know, who said uh, that uh, um, they expected more because the EU is about values, about human rights, and, uh, and still, you know, they wanted to see more engagement, no matter on which side, but it just, you know, it's, uh, it was quite... Um, for, for them, they were basically saying that they are absent. Um, I would not very, I mean, completely 100% agree with that because the EU was still kind of making calls, you know, including to Moscow, trying to find, uh, find the way to kind of mediate something, doing something. And look, I mean, France is uh, definitely, I mean, the EU member state, which is uh, the OEC means group, and they also try to work with uh, ceasefire, which failed. So, I mean, for the EU currently, after this kind of legacy of the recent war, it will be extremely difficult to argue um, for its uh, presence. And not, and I'm I'm not only talking about with things related to Russia-Turkey role, you know, that may, when they would want to push them away, 
but actually here, even on the ground, you know, and basically um, for years I have been hearing, you know, people complaining and saying they, that what the EU is really doing, I mean, what is their role in the conflict resolution? They could see that the EU is very active in Ukraine and Georgia, and in here in Nagorno Karabakh, they always kind of to pretend that with Spilo in the room, he does that Spilo does not exist really. Um, so that really kind of leaves a very little um, hope, uh, I would say, uh, for the potential of the EU role. And uh, I, I personally would love to see them doing more, uh, but um, my, my recommendations or probably kind of advice <laughs> would be just uh, probably to pay more attention to some other areas, including in the South Caucasus, because we, what basically was war, um, signal to some people is that with military solution is still possible you know you can go for war you know no matter how brutal it is and you can change the reality and this is not a good signal you know and this is something that we i don't think that anyone would want to kind of see repeating in some other places um we saw it before as well but i mean this is definitely not a good signal and probably the eu um for the eu it's a, a very kind of uh, important and urgent task to reinforce is just uh you know efforts not necessarily in the Gorna karabakh peace process but actually in some other places uh, in this eastern um partnership the second thing i, I agree with you about with rethinking of uh, this whole kind of, you know, concept of the Eastern partnership. Mm, look, I mean, with Nagorno-Karabakh has been the only conflict between the members, <laughs> you know, I mean, between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And for years, it has created a lot of, a lot of debate. You know, what is the position of the EU? What should be the position of the EU in this issue? Uh, maybe this is actually the time not to stop pretending that that problem <laughs> does not really exist and uh, um, maybe consider um, not just working with uh, certain capitals like Brussels, Belize, Brussels, Kiev, um, but they actually try to think uh, regional wise, you know, and not necessarily um, on, on the conflict uh, itself, which is super sensitive, you know, and creates a lot of uh, headache but maybe on communications, transport corridors, you know, building roads, connecting, providing something um, that can connect the region rather than just kind of working with uh, separate uh, capitals. And the third one, yeah, I think uh, this is kind of still the, uh, the question. And I, I spoke to some EU officials, they're super unhappy about that, about basically the potential that the only role that they may have in this uh, post-war situation is basically with cash. But uh, yeah, if this is a reality when they, uh, they are to only to provide uh, the humanitarian support, most probably through the UN agencies that hopefully will be having a certain kind of say um, in this post-war situation, then they should definitely do that. Because uh, this is something that they cannot just kind of ignore saying, oh my gosh, we, we were not part of this, uh, we don't like, like the statement, we don't like the arrangement, let's ignore the people. Um, I, I hope that uh, they will get the, that, um, I mean, take uh, use, make use of this opportunity and maybe by that they can engage more with those who, are, uh, who live in the conflict zone. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, some very good points. I was yesterday in discussion with uh, DJ Nier and also European External Action Service on the Eastern Partnership. Uh, and uh, we were also so raising this issue of Karabakh and uh, yeah, the lack of engagement from the EU side. Uh, let's be honest, I, I'm, I'm more working with member states than with Brussels at the moment. Yeah, I think that that makes maybe more sense. Uh, but I think it's definitely underestimated what happens here. At the moment in the region, yeah, which because it has it has a much broader impact. And um, I just wanted to have one one follow up question, uh, maybe which is the most uh, difficult one. I think uh, what this uh, ceasefire there are several things the ceasefire agreement does not provide, yeah. But I think the key issue is the the status of of Karabakh. So what what will be the future status of of Karabakh? What do we expect at the moment in terms of how this can be negotiated. Um, I, 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 can, I just cannot imagine how both sides can make compromises under these current uh, circumstances. Um, and just, just 
maybe just your thoughts on how how this could be negotiated, having in mind that the Minsk format is, yeah, we don't know what will happen with the Minsk format. Look, uh, there are things that uh, I would love to see, and there is also the reality. <laughs> and I have to take uh, into consideration the reality. And uh, basically what uh, the reality has been showing uh, in during the recent weeks since uh, the war is that much of the uh, with international system, and I'm not talking about only about the OEC, but actually the UN itself, they, they just are not uh, poss they are not able to respond, uh, not to mention the prevention. Uh, of the new world. And uh, this is a major problem because if we are talking about and we are discussing the potential uh, peace process, you know, restart of the negotiation, then we actually need to get a format. And the, if the UN and OEC, they are not able to handle that, um, or they do not really kind of find the proper place there, then the issue will stay in the hands of uh, Ankara, Moscow, Baku, and Yerevan. And uh, for Yerevan, this is definitely the worst scenario that they can imagine, because uh, that basically leaves them um, completely silent, you know, they will have very little space and little say in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, what will be the potential status. I personally believe that um, right now we are in, in, in the situation that leaves very little space for, um, for kind of profound discussion on the status. And I, I wonder whether that makes actually sense to start political demands for again independence or even reunification with Armenia in this current situation when you have first, I mean, what, what I described, you do not really have a security arrangements on the ground. You do not really understand what um, uh, the implementation of the ceasefire statement has not been completed. All of these things can easily be framed through the um, Armenian, for example, or what, whoever aspiration, aspiration to get a status, and that will block uh, the consideration and the dialogue on, uh, on, on any, anything, you know, on, on any potential uh, setup in the region or even kind of, you know, the issue of opening the borders and all of that. Um, I, it's, I'm, I'm, I, I want to stay very careful by saying that, but I, I, I probably uh, would uh, say that this is not the time to push for Tukienia for Armenia for the status issue for the moment. Uh, and uh, it's better for them to get to kind of uh, uh, look around, understand what's a re new reality, you know, and take a pragmatic stance because uh, um, this status issue goes nowhere. And it very much depends on how you are going to advocate for this, uh, how you're going to demand it, and it, it, at what period of time, you know, so that you actually do not just kind of stay without what you um, need so much. And at the same time, you can have a chance uh, to get a support and a response um, from the international community and uh, also from some others. So that, that thing requ requires um, some profound considerations, I would say. And I would just not rush just by demanding, hey, you know, this is the time for us to, uh, to, to declare independence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's shift to Ukraine and uh, to Nikolaus von Twickel. I think there we have a different situation. There is um, OSCE and um, presents, and there's also more, much more engagement um, of the EU. Um, maybe you can give us an update where we are at the moment um, uh, with, 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 with the conflict in the Donbass, um, and maybe also some lessons learned in dealing with Russia um, and, and, and EU engagement uh, in, um, in this conflict. Please. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Uh, and hello to everybody again. Uh, the, the, indeed, uh, Ukraine is a, is a very big uh, story. It's a very big country. Uh, it has more inhabitants than uh, the three South Caucasus uh, countries put together. And uh, it is, of course, uh, geographically and uh, uh, mentally, uh, psychologically, to put it that way, uh, closer to Europe uh, than, um, for instance, Karabakh is. Uh, still, um, uh, you are quite, oh, um, uh, no, this hasn't been discussed, but still, um, the, the, the fact remains that uh, European involvement 
uh, emotional involvement in Ukraine is still um, very much in its infancy, or put it other way, um, underdeveloped, i.e. when there is a war in eastern Ukraine, um, this doesn't really rattle uh, public opinion in Western Europe. Uh, I think this is something that is uh, fundamental and that, that, that has to be uh, acknowledged, uh, especially by the Ukrainians, uh, which um, my impression is uh, where, where policy has been shaped um, as much in the past uh, from, from you know, rational guidelines, but also from this <clears throat> deep uh, and growing um, dissatisfaction uh, by a lack of, um, uh, say, empathy uh, in Europe um, <clears throat> from uh, about the fate of Ukraine. <clears throat> That's, I think, a, a, a very important message. Um, uh, coming to the, the topic now um, of uh, European Union involvement and European Union uh, policy, uh, you're right, uh, there is much, uh, there is a lot of involvement in Ukraine. Um, I think um, I've been to, to a lot of uh, seminars uh, during the past five, uh, six years, um, and the, um, uh, you can always draw the conclusion that everybody is quite upbeat, quite optimistic uh, about the reform process in Ukraine. Um, the, um, the underlying feeling is uh, we achieved something uh, from where there is no way back. Uh, we have moved beyond 2014, uh, moved beyond the Yanukovych era, which was basically um, Ukraine trying to wiggle through between Russia and the EU. And now we are firmly on the path towards uh, Western style democracy, towards liberalization, etc. Um, unfortunately, I think, um, and most people um, I think agree, um, the year 2020 um, has um, uh, and has has brought uh, some some major disappointment uh, to this theory. Um, I mean, apart from 2020 being uh, gripped by the pandemic, um, we've seen major setbacks in Ukraine, especially in uh, the sphere of uh, anti-corruption policies, uh, in the um, in the judicial sphere, especially, and we've seen um, I've. Just this morning, I listened to a very interesting podcast uh, from my old colleague and friend, uh, Ben Aris. Um, he has a website called Intelli uh, IntelliNews. I can uh, put up the, uh, the link later if you want. Um, a podcast with two Ukrainian economists, uh, senior economists actually, on uh, the, the policy of the Ukrainian government versus the World Bank. And uh, the, uh, the upshot, the, the takeaway of this is, uh, under Zelensky now, the, <clears throat> the policy has been formed to do as little as necessary for the, the World Bank and the IMF and as much as possible for the oligarchs uh, the, or the oligarch, oligarchic interests and just wiggle through again so that the, ultimately the um, <clears throat> financial backing and the financial uh, support from international donors is not lost. But, but, but that also um, they do as little as necessary uh, for, for the reform agenda that is uh, demanded uh, by the, uh, the, the donors. And so that it, uh, again, it, that we get, we get um, this outcome of the, 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 the smallest possible um, uh, advance, the smallest possible amount of reform, which in effect is uh, quite frustrating. Um, it means that the game continues, that we're not going to go on a new, we're not going to, um, you know, the, the game is not going to change, but it is continuing on the lowest uh, level possible. It's like a football game where all the players are doing as little as possible. And we all know, we, if we all like football, we know that this is the most boring uh, thing that we can get to. <clears throat> So, um, and, and now let me come, uh, let me talk a little about uh, Donbass and, uh, and the uh, involvement uh, or the, 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 the separatists or the, the territorial conflict uh, that we have here. Um, I, I think um, this, is, uh, this is, of course, a very uh, important um, uh, issue, uh, especially with regard to Georgia. 
um, in, in Georgia and, and especially, of course, in, in all of the Caucasus with Nagorno Karabakh. Uh, everybody understands these uh, problems uh, much more than maybe in Europe. Um, <clears throat> and I think the, the situation there is um, uh, as much as we can see uh, also very frustrating um, in that um, the sides are also trying to do as little as necessary um, as they can uh, in order to, to get uh, anywhere closer to move to a solution. And uh, on the same, same side, they, they do as, as much as they can for their own side. So, uh, I mean, uh, th there is, of course, a, a feeling, a notion that both in Kiev and Moscow, um, <clears throat> policymakers are trying to talk as little as possible about Donbass because it's not the most popular thing, neither in Russia nor in, in Ukraine. <clears throat> but those who do talk about it, they talk about it in the most patriotic ways. And they will uh, continue to, um, you know, the, the Russian side will continue to carry on the narrative that this is the, um, the civil war in Ukraine, where uh, Russia is a mediator and that uh, the, um, the people of Donbass are fighting for their rights against this nationalistic uh, quasi fascistic uh, government in fascist government in Kiev. Whereas, of course, in Kiev, uh, the notion is that uh, Russia uh, the, is the aggressor that is trying to uh, destroy Ukraine and trying to destroy Donbas <clears throat> and trying to thwart uh, any any further um, uh, activities of, of Ukraine to move towards uh, Europe. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so there is there is very little um, sense of progress uh, there, and and the, the course of 2020 has shown that uh, even with uh, the economic uh, circumstances becoming as bad as possible and um, the, the, the current situation is, is clearly the worst uh, in the whole, uh, the, the economic situation in Donetsk and Luhansk has never been so bad, um, not, not since the 1990s and certainly not since 2014. Uh, if you want to uh, read some, some more about that, um, I, I also um, suggest um, uh, you, you open the site civicmonitoring.org, where I, I have a, um, a sort of a blog um, every two or three weeks. I, I put up a new report on, on the latest uh, developments. <clears throat> and, and, and currently the situation is really, really bad. Um, there is no idea where, um, um, how the, um, the backbone of the economy, the, the um, metal and uh, coal industry can be saved from, uh, from further ruin. And um, I'm, I'm currently really wondering, um, you know, why we're not seeing a major exodus of the people uh, from there because th there is no way they can, um, most people can, can earn their incomes anymore. <clears throat> and um, um, I think that uh, we, we, we are seeing, um, but we're certainly not seeing any signs of um, future economic well being in the region. Um, so even if, we, if you regard it with um, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, or, well, I'm not, not going to talk about Karabakh in this respect, uh, but uh, if, you, if, you regard, if you compare it to there, I think um, um, <clears throat> the, um, obviously, you know, we're, we're talking of a very different uh, dimension of, of economic well-being, of, of industrial base. Um, the, the way um, that the econom eco economy is falling down is, is just much more dramatic than um, it ever has been in, in the Caucasus. <clears throat> so um, cutting a long story short, I think uh, um, we're seeing that there is, there is, a, a, you know, there is a certain will from, si from the side of the EU to keep up, the, um, keep up going the reform progress in, in, in Ukraine. Um, but, but there are certain, there are a lot of deficits. And uh, the main deficits I've been I've been I've written them up um, in in various publications um, already. Uh, the main problem is, for instance, that in Ukraine the EU is is quite um, atomistic, um, so there is no single um, person and no single body that is responsible for Ukraine. Um, there is a so-called support group in the EU, um, which um, is basically in, based in Brussels and used to be headed by the very 
uh, energetic uh, Peter Wa Wagner, who unfortunately um, left uh, earlier this year and um, uh, doesn't have a clear successor. Um, in, in Kiev itself, um, there is um, a, a new reform uh, body, uh, an adv advisory mission, um, the EU AM. Um, but this uh, advisory mission is only responsible for the areas of law, um, rule of law, and um, reform of um, ref reforming the um, uh, the law enforcement bodies, which is uh, of course quite quite a limited aspect of um, government of good governments and of, of reform. Um, so uh, what and, and then you have, uh, especially when you talk about Donbas, uh, you have um, no EU involvement at all in the peace process. Uh, you only have the OCE and the so-called the, the Normandy format, which is uh, Germany and France, Russia and Ukraine. And the story here is that, of course, by delegating uh, peace uh, work to the Normandy format, you signal to Ukraine that uh, the EU doesn't play a role in these things. It is the, 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 the old powers, the big powers in the EU, i.e. Paris and Berlin, who are uh, calling the shots and who are making the decisions. So that, that's another deficit, uh, definitely, psychologically speaking. And yeah, um, so and, and then just one word about Russia. Maybe um, I think the Russian position um, has not changed much over the years, <clears throat> very much to the frustration of all, um, all, all, all the parties involved. Um, the, um, the, 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 the one big um, uh, news of 2020 was the, that the, the main person in charge for Donbass uh, in the Kremlin, Mr. Surkov, who is also well known in, in Georgia and all over, any, any Russia watcher in the world um, uh, knows him pretty well, um, was, uh, was basically um, uh, uh, forced to leave his position and is now um, uh, Nobody really knows, understands what he's doing now, but um, he's been replaced and his uh, portfolio has been taken over by Mr. Kozak, who is the deputy uh, head of the um, presidential administration. Uh, and uh, the feeling is, the feeling was at the time that Mr. Kozak will try and uh, be, be a little more uh, economically efficient uh, versus Donbass than Mr. Surkov was. So Surkov was seen as an ideological actor and he was very much uh, thinking through this uh, Ruski Mir ideology, whereas Mr. Kozak is a very much, uh, um, much more uh, down to numbers and much more um, thinking about uh, how much will it cost. Um, but uh, if we look at Donbass, uh, we haven't really seen um, uh, uh, this uh, putting in effect. Um, what we've seen is that the, through the COVID crisis, um, the, uh, all the big uh, indus industrial um, plants in Donbass had to stop production and that now we're seeing that nobody really knows where income, where future income should be generated in Donbass itself um, without any aid from outside. So that's where we are right now. Um, not, not a particularly uh, positive uh, position or uh, we're not at a very uh, positive moment um, right now, I think. And um, the, the outlook for 2021 is, is not particularly optimistic. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to encourage everybody, uh, you can ask questions uh, through the chat <coughs> and Q&A function. Uh, and we also take questions in Georgian and, and we can translate it. So I think that's also an, an opportunity uh, just, to, um, yeah, just, just to remember you that you, you can take this, uh, these questions. Um, I think uh, what, is, what is maybe Different. Just, just one, one follow-up question. What is maybe uh, different in Ukraine, um, and it's also true for Georgia. I think you um, has quite a leverage uh, um, on 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 Ukraine in terms of um, being an important funder, um, ha having also quite a strong support in the society. Um, uh, why why the US does is this, is not using it uh, also in terms of because I think uh, the main thing for Ukraine is also getting this this. Um, um, uh, getting this reform process uh, uh, forward, yeah, and 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 uh, yeah, and uh, uh, so and I I think the, the question for me is why we have this rollback or this degradation also of the reform process. We now learned that it, it's not 
uh, irreversible. Yeah. So um, and um, and the question is why this why the, so is there's a lack of interest or is there nobody who's responsible for it? Just just from your from the Ukrainian perspective, and then we switch over to Nona uh, have have the broader EU perspective. I cannot hear you, uh, Nicolas. I think uh, your micro is. Sorry, again, uh, talking about leverage, uh, I think um, uh, the, the one, one issue definitely is that there is, a, there is no clear voice speaking from Brussels. Uh, we, we, what we lack is uh, somebody who is, uh, a, say, um, an, a reform envoy, somebody who could take up the work that uh, Peter Wagner did so well by sh uh, shuttling back and forth between Brussels and Kiev and also Berlin. Um, like, I mean, it is, it is actually very little known, uh, you know, not, not even in Berlin and, 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 and also not, not very well known in Brussels that uh, Chancellor Merkel has her own reform envoy to Ukraine, um, the former uh, um, Prime Minister of Saxony, <clears throat> um, who um, speaks at, at various uh, events, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm sorry to say that I, I cannot personally say of, of how much uh, impact he has had in Kiev. Um, <clears throat> so, um, and, uh, and, and uh, I don't know whether the French government um, has, has any uh, envoy uh, for, for the reform process in Kiev. So the whole situation is, is a bit, uh, you know, you said that the, the EU has a lot, a lot more leverage over Ukraine than over Georgia maybe. Um, but uh, then again, um, I see that, and the Ukrainians have have still uh, a lot of hope, put a lot of hope in the in, in Europe and, and the European Union. But in the end, uh, what the Ukrainians see right now, I think, is is mainly German actors and French actors, and not so much European actors. Um, this is maybe one one answer to your question. Um, <clears throat> and and the other thing is, of course, that um, uh, due to the pandemic, I think uh, this year a lot of um, uh, events uh, did just not take place as they should have taken place, and um, maybe this was um, this was um, uh, uh, one one opportunity for the um, for those in the Zelensky administration <clears throat> who are lobbying lobbying uh, some narrow business interests um, um, to to come f f to the fore. But then again, and there, there is another issue that I have of course not not been mentioning much is the the um, uh, is of course the element of the the pro Russian uh, politics that are being played in, in Ukraine. Um, uh, also something that is not so, um, that, is, that is different from Georgia because uh, Georgia doesn't have these, um, that has a different party system, let's put it that way, and an, also a different uh, oligarchic <laughs> system. Um, <clears throat> I think, <clears throat> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm prob probably not the best person to, to, to speak about this, but um, I think what we've seen recently in the, in the, during the Zelensky uh, administration is a, is a resurgence of these parties, uh, be they led by Mr. Medvedchuk or Mr. Boyko. And um, we've, we're also seeing that these parties, they, they are uh, not just playing on, on very easy um, populist uh, demands, um, they also seem to have um, a very, uh, a, a very wide um, <clears throat> uh, um, popular support in certain uh, parts of Ukraine, not just in certain parts of society, certainly in the working class, but also in the East. And uh, th this, this sort of support is something that um, is, is very difficult to explain uh, because it's not always very, um, it's not always very rational, but um, there's a feeling that these parties that they in at least in the Donbas, they will always have a certain a minimum support, a bit like the you know like the 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 Democrat Democratic Party used to have in the southern states of the United States. Um, there's always like 20, 30 percent of the population that is willing to to vote for these parties. Um, so so this is a, in short my answer, and uh, uh, I hope that uh, maybe somebody else wants to um, bring in some other aspects of this. <clears throat> so let's shift uh, to, to Nona. Um, looking to all these conflict zones and uh, 
maybe the, the, weak, the weaknesses also of the EU. So what are the discussions on the conflicts at the moment in, in Brussels and the member state? And is there a chance for a more comprehensive security policy? I think we see more articles also about uh, the need uh, for, for the US security actor, because this is the main challenge yeah, we, we, we face in, in, uh, in the Eastern neighborhood. So where, where are there the limits? Uh, and, and do you see any opportunities also? Thank you, Stefan. Good evening. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this webinar. Now, speaking about the use of uh, foreign policy to the South Caucasus, uh, I will focus more on Georgia also because, as Olesia said, um, we have seen this uh, complete absence of uh, uh, the EU um, uh, in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict resolution process and during the military escalation as well. But we have seen also the EU absent from the process of democracy promotion in Azerbaijan and Armenia, um, also because of the domestic policies of these uh, two states. Uh, Azerbaijan on its side never expressed the willingness to join Euro-Atlantic uh, institutions and Armenia, we know that uh, it was willing to sign an association agreement, but back in 2013, and refused to do uh, so precisely because of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh um, uh, conflict. So uh, I will like kind of bring as an example Georgia, but then of course we can expand uh, the discussion uh, during the Q and day also on uh, Azerbaijan and um, uh, and uh, Armenia. Now thinking about um, use involvement in the security field, um, I would. Uh, divide it with the three time period, which is uh, which are quite similar with each other. No? One is uh, from um, launching the EU neighborhood uh, policy uh, in 2004, up until 2008, up until the Georgia-Russia war. Uh, then uh, uh, EU policy from 2009, which uh, is uh, um, uh, the date of uh, uh, starting of uh, the EU European Eastern Partnership up until 2016, when the revision of the new NP came out together with the uh, EU global uh, strategy. And now the EU security role in the South, South Caucasus and toward Georgia, in contrast to that of Russia, has always been low key and centered on the provision of assistance to democracy promotion. Uh, in the conflict resolution, little has been done, even if conflict settlement was uh, has always been uh, a one of the main priorities of the European neighborhood policy. EU-Russia dialogue on conflict resolution in the Caucasus has been virtually absent, even if EU-Russia dialogue was one of the priority of the action plan uh, you designed with Georgia back in 2004. The EU's idea of conflict resolution was to work uh, on it indirectly through state building and democracy programs in an attempt to increase the appeal of uh, integration of sentient entities into their respective metropolitan states. In that sense, the Eastern Partnership is similar to what has been the ENP and its actions plans. Uh, before the war, 2008, uh, the EU supported the peaceful resolution of Georgia's conflict without being directly involved in mediation and without reacting to Russia's um, activities in Abkhazia or South Ossetia, uh, for example, Russia's provision of passports or military support to Abkhazia, the EU failed to commit itself uh, to internationalization of peacekeeping forces there and accepted uh, Russia's monopoly over peacekeeping. Now, the Eastern Partnership uh, has paradoxically consolidated this passivity. Uh, the nets and bolts of the YEP um, draw the EU away rather than closer to the conflict resolution effort. Uh, the Eastern Partnership somehow reconfirmed the EU's preference uh, to um, go ahead with the economic democratic assistance rather than to be active po politically in the conflict resolution. Uh, process and indeed uh, one of the uh, achievements of the uh, Eastern Partnership was that uh, signing of the association agreements and DCFTA with Georgia and uh, visa liberalization for Georgian citizens. Now so the Eastern Partnership has been characterized by absence of um, 
kind of preventive diplomacy in conflict resolution from new sites. Uh, and there are a number of reasons for this, uh, which are kind of actual also uh, today. One of uh, these reasons are, uh, is, of course, lack of political willingness to engage in a low scale military conflict or with that of frozen ones. Usually actors, external actors, in this case, um, you hoped and continues to hope for uh, the status quo or for newly emerged status quo. Uh, but as we know, hope is not a strategy. So we had something to do also with the absence of strategy from, from um, your side, meaning that you being uh, rather um, reactive rather than proactive in, in the con uh, conflict resolution and this preference to deal with the conflict in an ad hoc uh, manner. Uh, another reason is also difficulty to see and analyze the situation uh, from a regional perspective and from local perspective. Often the EU does not expect conflict escalation because from its own perspective, uh, conduct a war means high spendings. So it's not a rational choice. Um, but also at the academia level, no, at the expert level, uh, we see the same approach in the discussion. I remember after uh, Russia annexation of Crimea, there were a lot of talks in Western society, and especially here in Italy, is that escalating tensions and going beyond Crimea would be related to high costs, economic costs that loses. Therefore, Russia would not opt for uh, su such a solution. No? Now, in 2016, um, came out a new European kind of revision of European neighborhood the policy, a new EU global strategy. Uh, it was conceived of less a policy and more as a toolkit of instruments to be applied to, to the neighborhood more flexibly. Uh, but uh, still, uh, there was no strategy. How do we see this region in the future? What we want from Eastern Europe and what we want them to wish to obtain from us? Uh, another thing what we see since 2016 is that kind of real politic is in and idealism is out. Uh, uh, back in 2004, uh, the original ENP was based on notions that uh, the EU and its neighbors had common interests and shared values. Uh, the policy aimed to create kind of zone of prosperity and friendly neighborhood. No? The new EMP with its global strategy is based on EU pursuing its interest of which promoting universal values is presented as one interest among many. So the late motive of the both documents uh, is that principal pragmatism will guide the use external uh, action. So no great expectations really. The ENP is no longer about transforming the neighborhood. It is more transactional than transformative. Uh, and it explicitly says that the EU cannot solve many challenges in the region and uh, that our leverage is, uh, is limited. Now, on the one side, it's okay admitting uh, our limitations, but then the question now which emerges is how we can stabilize the region without fundamental democratic transformation. Uh, um, and the problems of this we, we are seeing now, right now in Georgia, no? what happened with the falsification of the elections and so on. In the new NP, uh, there is no mentioning of EU conflict resolution, however. The unresolved ethnic and geopolitical conflicts continue to be the major threat to security and stability in the region, especially for those countries that openly declared their European aspiration. However, both documents state that crisis response in the region will be subject to an ad hoc decision. This was the precisely the problem before, having no strategy to prevent and uh, resolve the conflict and opting for ad hoc decision. But in the EU's will, uh, the security issues in the region should be addressed as a process of everyday practices of governance. Since instabilities, uh, instabilities emerging in the neighborhood lie also and especially beyond the security domain, and namely in poverty, inequality, perceived sense of uh, injustice, corruption, weak economic and social 
social uh, development. Uh, so for the EU, these are the factors that increase then vulnerability and bring about uh, radicalization. Uh, does the EU appears to have become more kind of prudent in its actions towards the region, more reluctant to ins insist on democracy? and less willing to get embroiled in the local political tensions. Um, as for the conflict resolution, bearing in mind that the nature of the EU, um, there is little the union can do in relation, for example, to the Georgian Abkhaz Russian conflict settlement. Uh, the EU is present in Geneva talks and it is financing a set of peace building initiatives in order to achieve a conflict transformation. Then the UMM is monitoring the administrative borderline between Georgia and de facto South Ossetia. To expect more than that from Brussels in this very moment. Um, and to raise kind of expectations is simple and realistic. So um, I think that the EU has refused from the outset to make a substantial effort towards conflict resolution in the region. It uh, didn't, simply did not know how to counter Russia's hard power in the region, also because it could not offer hard security guarantees. It does not have a new army, for example. More generally, hard security and deterrence is not in the EU's nature. That role is for the NATO, but it has no security obligation towards the non-member states. We know this. Uh, does it remains extremely difficult for the West to contain Russia in the region in hard security terms, and we have seen this in Nagorno-Karabakh right now. Um, indeed, its political and diplomatic resources are insufficient to, to influence the, the peace process. So acknowledging this uh, reality, the global strategy as well as the new NP have uh, rightly, I would say, reduce the scope for frustration by refraining from rhetoric about the Union's perspective, further engagement in, in conflict resolution. The metropolitan state's problems and Georgia's problem, I think, has always been that they think that the external actors can somehow resolve their internal problems, including their territorial conflict. So I think that the youth global strategy, as well as the new NP, uh, have put an end to the ambiguity of the use rhetoric, uh, which used only to deceive the parties to the conflict and push them kind of into kind of passivity. So I think and that unfortunately the EU is uh, uh, in its fast, uh, and this is since 2016, in its uh, fast of openly uh, declared disengagement from conflict resolution process uh, in the region. Thank you.